Hey everybody, welcome back to Reason and Theology. Your host Michael. We are discussing uh, Saint John Henry Newman and the book by Dr. Matthew Levering, who I have here as a distinguished guest. His book is Newman on Doctrinal Corruption. Uh, let me pull it up, put it right there in the camera. You should be able to see it. And by the way, there is a link to it there. It's published by Word, Word on Fire. The link is in the description if you want to go and purchase a copy. Dr. Levering, welcome to the show. Truly an honor to have you. How are you? Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, it, it really is an honor. been following your work for a while, so I'm glad to have you on to talk about this. And it relates to the Magisterium, which is right up my alley, so I'm really excited. Before we dive into the book itself and its contents, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Are you a convert to Catholicism, cradle Catholic? How did you get interested in theology? Stuff like that. Yeah, that's right. I was I was born a Quaker. And so I grew up Quaker, which is really um, not not like Amish. It was just essentially more like Unitarian. But we would gather in silent silent meeting um, for for um, meeting for worship. But it was it was mainly political, uh, very much in in line with religious liberalism. So I do yeah. feel like I gained expertise in in religious liberalism, which Newman was concerned about. Yes, but, and and I know that um, you know one of the benefits of that is that I can see that. That religious liberalism, you know, so tempting. So in, uh, there's many people involved with it, and the people, by no means do I c condemn the people who are um, religiously liberal. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't condemn them as um, as human beings. I respect them, and but I know that they're seeking something deeper because I experienced that as a as a young man. They're they're seeking something deeper because um, you know without any without any real deep belief in God and there there's no salvation, mm. no, no redemption and no, um, no forgiveness of sins, mm. you know, so they, you know, no, no eternal communion with, with, um, with God and, and with our, the communion of saints. Sure. So um, they're really seeking something deeper. And so Newman speaks to people um, who have had that kind of experience. So Newman very much spoke to me as a, as a young man, my wife and I became Catholic and entered the church in um, 1995 mm -hmm. after a year of RCIA. So that was right after right after we both we got married in college. And so right after college. Yeah, um, awesome. And, and tell us a little bit about your academic credentials, too. Uh, well, so I, I teach here at Mundline Seminary um, and I have a, a research chair, essentially, that was donated by... Um, uh, James and Molly Perry, and they did that. They did that really because of the influence of Father Robert Barron, mm -hmm. you know, now, now Bishop Barron. Right. He was he was rector here, and so he established a chair. And I moved here in 2013 when he was rector, um, and I consider him a very dear dear friend and and a, a mentor. Yeah, awesome. Now, it sounds like, you know, I, I don't want to presume too much, but did you write this book partly because of your experiences going from being a Quaker to Catholic? You said that Newman really spoke to you here. So is that kind of responsible for this book? Well, in certain ways, um, it would be more the book comes out of my my life, mm -hmm. you know, my my own concerns. I, I very much am you know, wanting to help our beloved Catholic Church in so far as um, God wills. I'm very much concerned to help the beloved Catholic Church um, navigate the whole issue of religious liberalism. Yeah. You know, and so yeah. that's behind the book is that I do feel that um, that you know, if if one gets too um, as we're too punch drunk on on the notion of development of doctrine, so that anything becomes development. One can find oneself, um, you know, moving in a direction of religious liberalism, where Newman's dogmatic principle is no longer um, given the reverence, mm -hmm. you know, that it that it really deserves. And so, so the book that the book comes out of my own um, background to some degree, but also also the present moment. Sure. Now, some people are going to be familiar, obviously, with political liberalism. What exactly is religious liberalism? Well, so religious liberalism has been around um, for now for over two centuries, um, really more than that. Um, it has two dimensions. 
um, religious liberalism um, philosophically tends to hold that we really can't say anything um, that is um, we that uh, that is known to be true, mm-hmm. God. Yeah. And so philosophically, religious liberalism follows the path that you would find in Michel de Montaigne or um, Immanuel Kant. And basically, we can't say anything, um, you know, true about God. We can um, gesture toward the ineffable. We can gesture to the mystery of being. Um, you know, all religions can together gesture toward. Um, it's more the human instinct to worship. You know, the human instinct to gesture toward mystery. So that's the that's the philosophical element of religious liberalism. But and so essentially, dogma then is um, undermined because you can't really say anything about God. But um, the, the, then there's also then the um, historical element of religious liberalism. And mm-hmm. The historical element um, says that that um, our faith is essentially a um, human product, you know, and that it uh, arises um, through human a series of human inventions. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, this is um, you find this in some historical critical um, going all the way back to Newman's Newman's day or before. Mm-hmm. Um, but and so that's um, that's uh, part of the book. You know, part of the book sure. I talk about Edward sure. Gibbon. Edward Gibbon is a, a key figure um, for development of, th- of religious liberal historical thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, he, he's from late 18th century. The way you described religious liberalism there sounds a lot like the vital eminence perspective condemned um, by Pius X, you know, from the modernist mm-hmm. era. Is, is is that effectively what you're getting at? That's it. That's yeah. it. The so-called modernism, the so-called modernism is just our, our Catholic version of um, what was originally, um, you know, Protestant religious mm-hmm. liberalism. Mm-hmm. Now, Catholic, Catholics had a version of that, but the modernism you know, is the sort of, it, it was gaining in popularity, you know, there in France. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, yeah. so it really caught the attention right around 1900. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Now tell me a little bit about John Henry Newman for those who may not be familiar with him. Who exactly was he? So Newman was, um, you know, the greatest British Catholic, uh, maybe since, uh, depending on your view of Blessed Duns Scotus, <laughs> <laughs> you know he, New, Newman is, of course, a great giant. New, Newman, sure. in my view, is is a, a theologian on par in terms of his um, depth and and richness with an Augustine. Um, New, Newman's an incredible theological giant, but he he did a tremendous amount of different things in his life. So he's it, it's difficult to pin him down um, just in in a few sentences, but. But Newman, his main theological contribution, uh, although <laughs> there were many, but his main theological contribution really is this, the way that he was able to engage what I call Renaissance historiography, hmm. or the, the understanding of history that emerges um, after the Renaissance. And see, Newman is building upon um, two centuries of battle between Protestants and Catholics where they're arguing about the about like who's right, you know, what's the real church, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, all, all that stuff. And so, and then Newman is also very aware of this, of the new, the rise of skeptical historiography, you know, hi, skeptical historical studies, basically saying that neither is right, neither mm-hmm. Protestants nor Catholics is right, but it's all just a bunch of um, invention. So Newman is the one that engages this at a deep level and is able to um, help us understand Catholic dogma um, as apostolic, and he he shows us, you know, how to do that. Now he does that because he himself is a is a um, convert. He's sort of been through it all, you know. Newman experienced everything as a young um, young man in in Britain in the 1820s. You know, he was an evangelical Anglican, the Reformed Anglican for a while. You know, he was very close to. Um, people who went the religiously liberal direction, you know, mm-hmm. um, and Newman also um, then converted to Catholicism in, in um, 1845, you know, right around the time, right around the time of the publication of the essay on the development of Christian doc- doctrine. Now, I don't know if I've said anything that, that um, I haven't packaged it neatly, but Newman's a tough guy to package. 
<laughs> for, for sure. And, and he's also a doctor of the church. So re recently yes. made a doctor of the church. Yeah. Yeah. So certainly uh, an interesting figure. Now, what you you mentioned there, doctrinal development, that's kind of what we all know Newman for. Can you tell us exactly what what was his view on doctrinal development? And was it was it unique or was it, you know, with precedent? Okay, so his view was um, that dogma, Catholic dogma, you know, and you would think here of uh, the do dogma on sacraments, the Council of Trent, and, and so on. Um, Catholic dogma has developed in accordance with a, uh, or, and he doesn't use it, he uses organic metaphors, he uses different metaphors, that the basic issue is is like where did this come from is it is it true you know is it um was it all there at the beginning mm -hmm. if it wasn't all there at the beginning you know did did the church then invent it mm -hmm. you know yeah. i mean if it can't be found in the bible a, a lot of these questions come already from uh you know the protestant reformation as you can tell mm -hmm. but um yeah. like if it can't be found in the bible explicitly if it wasn't there f in an explicit way in the first second first second third century mm -hmm. you know is yeah. it is it true or is it just an invention of um of catholics you know human mm -hmm. invention that that's that's a real issue and so newman newman takes that issue up with bravery and he delivers a set of notes yeah uh, seven yeah. notes by which um a true development can be known but the the word development is is important here because newman is is indicating um, the way that an idea can unfold or the way that a mystery mm -hmm. can unfold and um, we can discover new dimensions of that mystery, um, new aspects of that reality. You know, we can make links and connections that um, expose, uh, you know, new ways of, of interpreting scripture and understanding particular passages, you know, of divine revelation. So, so divine revelation opens up for us in the course of history Hmm. And we gain a deeper understanding of the contents of divine revelation, but but Newman insists development is not corruption. Yeah. So doctrinal yeah. development does not involve um, corruption, and what corruption would be would be human invention, okay. you know, just simply inventing inventing stuff and calling it um, calling it part of the deposit of faith, or as if mm -hmm. Jesus had anything to do with it. That would be invention or or what's called um, corruption. And my, my book is about doctrinal corruption. You know, it, it's not not as much about doctrinal development because a number of very important um, and beautiful uh, studies of development have appeared in the last few years. You know, and so I didn't, I didn't want to just replicate that. So I focus on doctrinal corruption. Yeah, which is very helpful because we, we don't hear enough about that from Newman. So I'm glad you placed that at the forefront. Now, just follow up for something you said there, kind of take us down a rabbit trail for just one second. You mentioned there the content of the deposit of faith and whether or not, you know, a Newman's thought, something has to be explicit in scripture as maybe a Protestant would indicate, uh, or at least some of them would. Um, did, did he take a material sufficiency view or was he of the view that, no, it's kind of part, part in scripture and then there's part of divine revelation that's just partly in the oral tradition what what perspective did he take there well you know what i don't i don't quite remember i mean congar seems to take a material sufficiency view yeah um congar but yeah but did newman did newman think along those lines I, i'm trying to i'm trying to remember um newman would think again he gets a lot of this from the, his the, his anglican time yeah. and so the anglicans held to material sufficiency but sure. they just thought that they thought that you couldn't um you know you couldn't know what what really pertains you couldn't know how to read it you know without the fathers mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. for the for anglicans like newman you would have the material sufficiency of scripture everything would be in scripture but but yet you couldn't you couldn't know you know what was in scripture my my uh, without the fathers without the assistance of the fathers but my my view is that um and I'm trying to think on this. Mm -hmm. my, my view is that Newman probably does not does not hold to material sufficiency because at least not in some sort of strict sense, because he, mm -hmm. he often brings up 
brings up issues. Um, for example, an issue that he brings up is the efficacy of baptism. You know, what does baptism do? Yeah. You know, what is it? What does it bring about in the person? Sure. And Newman does. He brings up issues like this, and he just says, "Look, you know, um, Scripture doesn't suffice to tell us, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. what it what it does. I mean, Scripture gives us suggestions, but but um, you know, we're kind of we need we need um, we need help. Essentially, we need the the community, sure. you know, the the apostolic community um, that that was practicing, you know, practicing these things. Uh, another issue would be like infant baptism." You know, you can find some passages that you could, you know, when when uh, Cornelius and his household are baptized or something. Sure. But you know, uh, Newman Newman has different issues that he brings up like that. I I don't know. My my own view on this is that is that I do tend to take. Um, I I don't see anything wrong with material sufficiency. Mm-hmm. And and the reason I hold that though is that I I think that. You, we can find um, scriptural passages for all the doctrines of Catholic faith, um, but those scriptural passages will not be clear. Sure. However, without sure. um, you know, without the light given by faith, by the Church's faith, by tradition, you know. Yeah. So, so I, I hold to my own position as um, a material sufficiency, and all this is a roundabout way to say that I'm not quite sure what Newman as a Catholic thought on that position, but my own position is sufficiency. Yeah. I I haven't been able to really, you know, pin him down to any one position. So that that's helpful to know uh, that he he hasn't necessarily taken an explicit position um, in in so far as what we've seen. It's also good to know you're part of the material sufficiency gang where (laughs) 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 I I also prefer the material sufficiency view. I I mean, ultimately I think that one can maintain the part and part and view. Um, I think that's, that's a possibility within Catholicism, but I I see more strength for the material sufficiency perspective. So I'm right there Mm -hmm. with, you. Now, in the introduction, you talk about James Mosley. Can you tell us who he was and what were some of his his criticisms of Newman? Well, M- Mosley was a, a wonderful figure and a, and a, an amazing writer. You know, these these British Anglicans were amazing writers. They had mm-hmm. a lot of them had the gift, you know, um, which I, I don't have, but they had this education. Um, anyway, the Mosley was the was Newman's brother-in-law, mm-hmm. and he had been an ally of Newman as a Tractarian. You know, he he supported Newman, um, but when Newman, um, you know, wrote, he began to have doubts about the Tractarian uh, path, and so Mosley then uh, was, of course, quite alarmed. And then when Mosley saw the essay on the development of Christian doctrine, and when he saw that Newman had converted. Mosley was simply horrified because what Mosley said was, look, Newman, what you've done is you have given, you've, you've proved um, that you've sort of, you've sort of crossed the Rubicon in the sense that you've, you've corrupted, you've entered into a state of, of doctrinal corruption yourself because mm-hmm. you've, you've embraced these corruptions that the mm-hmm. Roman church, mm-hmm. you know, so Mosley saw the Roman church as, as, um, you know, filled with various corruptions. And so for Mosley, Newman's theory of development just simply masks corruption, you know, mm-hmm. and what, corru- what corruption is, is human invention. Okay. And so Mosley, Mosley was telling Newman, he says, Newman, come back, come back to scripture and the fathers, you know, the fathers say up to the, up to the sixth or seventh century, you know, so come back to scripture and the early fathers, he says, Newman, you have, you've, you had it right, but your your mind, your your quest for certainty, or whatever it was, your your restlessness, has really caught you here, and now you've entered into you've embraced these human corruptions, you know, um, and so Mosley said, "Come back, <laughs> come back." <laughs> Did he mention any specific examples of corruptions that he felt that Newman embraced? Well, the the um, Anglicans had a had a list of of those corruptions. You know, the High Church Anglicans had a had a list. The Tractarians. Mm-hmm. That, um, that was what Newman was. He was a great leader in the in that movement, and they they had a list of them. And they, they these lists were the reasons why they didn't become Catholic. Mm-hmm. 
So some of them would have to do with the with the papacy itself, the um, the jurisdiction. You know, so as you as you probably know, um, you know, the papacy had had a lot less um, juridical power. You know, sure. in the in the early church. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the other apostolic sees had quite a bit of um, quite a bit of power. Um, sure. The papacy, you know didn't make appointments, you know, didn't appoint the next um, archbishop, the the curia, you know, they would, they would be very concerned about the curia, you know, you know, these kind of things. But there are other, there are others also, you know, um, having to do with, um, you know, uh, some of the sacraments um, and, and others, uh, they, they had, they had quite a significant list. Um, and if, if you talk to high church Anglicans, they they would they still might have some of these, sure. You know, sure. but but yeah. So mostly wrote wrote a wrote a list, and Newman knew what they were. You know, <laughs> sure, sure. Now you already told us what doctrinal corruption is per Newman. It's going to be in um, an innovation, an invention of the church. Mm -hmm. Tell us why Newman saw that as a threat. Well, so Newman strongly believed in in a deposit of faith. You know, that Jesus had truly revealed something, had truly given a revelation, and a revelation that was cognitive in the sense that it was knowable. So Jesus had truly given us something, um, and that revelation had been handed down. He'd given that revelation to the apostles, and that revelation had then been handed down, you know, in, in all sorts of, in different ways, in different ways, um, you know, by um, the apostles in the apostolic community. Of course, one of the key ways was uh, scripture, mm -hmm. you know, but also mm -hmm. the apostolic community and the practices and and so on, you know, and, and understandings. Um, so, so Newman believed very strongly then in this gift of a divine revelation. So there, see, Newman was um, quite on the same path as his evangelical Anglican friends or his um, Tractarian. Anglican friends, and um, of course, he also agreed with the Eastern Orthodox. <laughs> um, so um, that's the that's the point of difference between Newman and the religious liberal is that Newman believes that Jesus has given a, a cognitive, you know, a knowable revelation about God, about him, about Jesus Himself, and about um, about humanity and our destiny. So, to um, since Jesus gave that revelation, obviously to um, tamper with it to to um, innovate in a way that takes away from it, you know. To uh, remember, there at the end of the Book of Revelation, um, there's this comment saying, "Anybody that messes with this, uh, let them be anathema." Yeah, you know that type yeah. of thing. You know, so you don't want to you don't want to be um, taking the revelation given by our Lord and and. Uh, damaging it or um, taking something away from it or inventing something and saying that it comes from our Lord, mm -hmm. you know, just inventing something and then saying it comes from our Lord, that kind of thing. You know, so Newman feels that the Holy Spirit will um, preserve the church um, from, from this, this corruption. Newman, the Catholic felt that, mm -hmm. uh, but um, obviously it's a huge issue. It's a huge issue because we want to know what Jesus has given us. You know, we don't really want to know what, um, you know, Pope Pope John the Seventh <laughs> gave us. You know what I mean? I mean, if it, sure. Pope John the Seventh invented it, who cares? Sure, sure. You know what I mean? You know, we don't. I mean, we want to be we want to be followers of Jesus and to live in His Word, and His Word is truth, and His Word is salvific. So that's what we want, you know. And then, anyway, so that's sure. that's kind of a long answer, long answer to your great question. And and that's certainly relevant to today because I mean we still have Protestants obviously saying that there's corruption in uh, Catholic doctrine as well as Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox among others. So, yeah. So let let's dive into kind of the heart here, the heart of the book. You you have five different chapters where you go over various dialogues that Newman had with other individuals. Uh, the first one was Gibbon. Can you maybe give us a summary of each of these starting with Gibbon? What, what exactly was his exchange about and how did it turn out? 
Okay, so so Gibbon is um, a key figure because he writes the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and this multi-volume uh, work. And Gibbon had converted as a young man; he'd become a Catholic. Yeah. Um, yeah. In in his teens, and his father then sent him to a Calvinist a Calvinist pastor, and Gibbon lost lost his faith entirely. And he ended up sort of as a cultural Anglican or like a nominal Anglican, this, um, you know, not really believing in, in any sort of divine revelation, but believing that it was respectable um, for English people to be to be Anglican in some in some fashion. So Gibbon, though, was a tremendous intellectual um, and Newman reads him and discovers this these wonderful attacks upon scripture and upon the church fathers. So yeah. Newman is yeah. reading him, and and essentially, um, the whole point of Gibbon was it's all invented. It's all invented. He, Gibbon's idea about about the um, early church was that the early church invented the notion that Jesus was divine. Oh. Um, for Gibbon, the original Jewish Jesus um, never made any claim to divinity. Mm -hmm. You know, was knew that he was just a man. You know, and really had nothing to do with Christian do um, dogmas about about Jesus at all. So the original Jewish Jesus. Um, then in Gibbon's view was uh, was quickly um, uh, gotten rid of by the earliest the early church and and Gibbon has an account of how that happened and then Gibbon goes into the church fathers and his uh, he gives an account of Athanasius that's that's hilarious it's really beautifully written Gibbon is an incredible rhetorical stylist and so he does says that these these so-called church fathers they were just irascible um, power power mm, people mm. it was all about power in other words mm -hmm. they were just like um trying to cram their ideas down the other guy idea down the throat of everybody so yeah. they could have the yeah. power and they were just power hungry people who invented stuff and forced it down the throat in order to increase their own power so everything's about power you know um so given sees christianity as just a one massive um power grab after another and and there's no truth there's no truth in it but what there is is power mm. so given there you can see how how important given is you know mm -hmm. uh, there because that's newman understands that's the issue then if there has not been true development then what there has been is power grabs so like pope pope john the seventh doing a power grab or whatever you know pope john the 13th doing a power grab you know, inventing stuff to get power. And so now, obviously, there have been power struggles and power issues within the church. And so then the question is, is it all about power? So, so Newman then is going to go directly and going to respond to Gibbon in, in almost every, every work that he does. Gibbon's a key figure um, from, from um, early on in, Gibbon, in Newman's life. And and Newman responds in a very powerful way to Gibbon's reductionism mm. and, and so on. Um, anyway, so that's the chapter one. Yeah, yeah. Now the next figure is Froude. Can you tell us about the exchange <laughs> with him? Well, of course, Froude is, Hurl Froude is decisive. He's, he's Newman's great friend who essentially converts Newman from being an evangelical Anglican or reformed Anglican um, to being the Newman we know now to being the Tractarian Newman who was very Catholic leaning. Mm -hmm. This was in the new, he was converted in 1829, 1830, mm -hmm. you know, Freud ends up dying young, mm -hmm. uh, tragically. Um, but, but Newman and then Newman eventually then becomes Catholic. But um, so Freud is the one who points Newman toward the Catholic church because Freud does, Freud has this intense, um, what I would call like an intense purity of, of thought and, and intense zeal. And so what Freud says is, look, um, the Anglican church, because at the time, at the time parliament, of course, was um, passing new laws about who could be in parliament. And so you didn't have to be an Anglican. You didn't have to, um, to be in parliament. You no longer had to be an Anglican. You could be an atheist or whatever. And so, Parliament, however, had the power over the Anglican Church to determine um, bishops and so on. Now, nominally, the king had the power, but really it was Parliament. And so, and so Freud says, look, 
this was a critique of Erastianism. Erastianism is um, when the state controls the church. You know, and so Fru says, look, if 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 a non-Anglican parliament is going to control the Anglican church, mm-hmm. then the result is going to be that the church will be made in the image of the the state, made in the image of of the the people of the nation. So that kind of thing, Newman Frude says, look, that is going to invent, corrupt, you know, um, decimate Christian doctrine. You know, Frude says this is an incredible concern. You know that um, if we have a if the church is going to be set up where non Anglicans, you know, control the church, then then the Anglican church um, will uh, fall into doctrinal corruption. You know, that's the key point. And so Newman really responds to that. Newman Newman picks it up, and that's that's the origin of the Tractarian movement there, um, right there. And and so that that is just uh, crucial for, for Newman in every possible way. Now, another figure that you take up in Chapter 3 is Francis Newman. What exactly was um, John Henry Newman's exchange with Francis Newman? Uh, Francis Newman's another one, just like Hurl Fruit. Francis Newman is completely decisive. And you you encounter Francis Newman, but never named uh, all throughout Newman's writings. Now, mm-hmm. also, you encounter his his other brother. Newman had three brothers, one of whom became quickly became an atheist. Mm-hmm. You know, then and that was Charles and the older. And then um, then you have Francis, who is closest to, to John. And they both converted and both become evangelical Anglicans and in their teens at the very same time. So they both had this conversion experience and they both kind of come to Christ and become real believers in Jesus Christ and in the deposit of faith and so on as ev- evangelical or reformed Anglicans at, in their teens. But so these two brothers, very, very close, but one brother went more, went toward dogma and toward the church mm-hmm. and toward faith. But the other brother took a very, the very opposite path and grew, grew to find that dogma was enslaving and false. Mm-hmm. And so Fra- Francis Newman has this book called Phases of Faith, which is his spiritual autobiography. And it's the very opposite of the Apologia Pro Vita Sua. Wow. So, but Francis wrote his first. So when you read the Apologia Pro Vita Sua, you got to know that Newman is responding to phases of faith. And Newman is saying, um, if you don't make these mistakes, you're not going to go in the direction that phases of faith went, which was a very anti-dogmatic. You know, um, essentially, Francis became a Unitarian. Wow. And, yeah. and so uh, Newman just says, look, it's, it's these mistakes that led Francis in this path. But, but they, they still loved each other, you know. Um, you know, God be praised. They they still they still loved each other. Yeah, but he's teasing out. Look here, here. If you accept this air, here's where it leads. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, exactly. That's right. Now, a huge figure that you always see in high church Anglicanism is is Pusey. Um, yeah. He also Newman also has an exchange with him. So here's an exchange with uh, another heavy hitter. How did that go? And what, what exactly were they talking about? Well, Pusey is is truly a, a great mind and, and someone to be very much respected. So um, you know, Pusey is is calling back to Newman and just you know, especially after the definition of Mary's immaculate conception. But particularly, you got to remember the way that was defined was that the Pope defined it. You know, mm-hmm. the Pope the Pope defined it and did so at dogmatically, there, thereby thereby indicating that he, he had um, the ability to, on as it were, on his own after consultation, but on his own to define um, doctrine infallibly. You know, so this is essentially papal infallibility. Mm-hmm. Now, papal infallibility, of course, wasn't defined until until the First Vatican Council, but it's still it's still basically the same thing. You know, mm-hmm. so so Pusey is kind of saying, "Hey, look what you did, Newman." <laughs> yeah, you know, it's yeah. like look what you did, man. It's like it's like they're inventing stuff. It's like I told you so. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So Pusey's saying they're inventing stuff, and and here we go. 
you know, so and now they've invented this, they're going to start inventing a bunch of other stuff. And, and they're corrupting doctrine. This is the Roman church is doing what I told you it would do. That's what Pussy is telling Newman in this very lengthy and, and scholarly, um, you know, work where he goes through the fathers. And he's arguing, he's arguing the church fathers do not support the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. And now Pussy believes that, of course, that um, Pussy believes that um, Mary was ascent was was sinless in a certain way that Mary didn't did not sin, mm-hmm. but um, Pussy does believes that Mary was tainted by original sin. Yeah, do, do you yeah. see? And so that Mary had original sin in some way. You could you could say that Pussy's position would would be um, perhaps somewhat similar to Thomas Aquinas's, you know, that kind of thing. And so. Pussy, Pussy, of course, knows all the debates between Dominicans and Franciscans and, and loves all that stuff. <laughs> you know, so mm-hmm. he's bringing up the church fathers and, and then everything else. And, sure. and that's his thing. And so Newman responds to him. You know, Newman does not let that go unanswered. Now, now Pussy ended up writing three or four long books, but Newman only, <laughs> Newman only responded to one, you know, one of them. And, and Newman just says, Newman says, wait a second, the church fathers teach that Mary is the new Eve. Mm-hmm. You know, and so, and the church fathers do do not think that Mary sinned, but she's the new Eve, and that mm-hmm. that is his key re, key response, essentially saying that, um, look, Eve Eve was not fallen, you know, mm-hmm. before before she fell, but if the new Eve, the eschatological Eve, you know, mm-hmm. the the um, complement of the new Adam, the the um, the Lord Jesus Christ, um, the new Eve is certainly not going to be worse. Than the first Eve was, that's Newman's fundamental argument. Now he makes he makes a more argument than that, but but he's responding to the issue of doctrinal corruption there. The a very strong charge, you know, brought by um, Pusey and Newman responds to it and responds to it on the ground of the fathers, and then ultimately on the ground of scripture, as well. So yeah. that's an important dialogue. Yeah, but and and Newman loved Pusey anyway. He loved um, his friend. I mean, they they. Their friendship, um, you know, no, it wasn't intact um, because of the pain of separation, mm-hmm. you know. But it, they remained friends, and Newman had a great regard for Edward Pusey. Now, you also mentioned papal infallibility was brought up as an objection by P- Pusey. So the other one was from Dolinger, and he also brings that up, of course, right? Dolinger rejecting yeah. uh, the first Vatican Council's definition on papal infallibility. So let, how, how does Newman grapple with that objection? And uh, what, what were some other things that Dolinger brought, brought up in that exchange? Well, you know, and so Pusey does write some later books on papal infallibility, but in the book that Newman responds to, Newman is responding mainly to the, to the issue of the Marian dogma of 1854, you know, Mm -hmm. Mac conception, but, but, um, but Pussy, of course, keeps on writing. And so he, Mm -hmm. he later writes, he later writes a couple books on, on papal infallibility. Mm -hmm. But, um, now Dollinger though, is the, is just, um, Dollinger is sort of the figure from the 19th century that if anybody really cares about where the church is today, Mm -hmm. Dollinger is the one you've got to pay attention to, and you've got to pay attention to that, that crisis. Uh, which was a German crisis um, emerging already in the 1850s. And so Germany was entering into, into a, um, you know, national consolidation. Mm-hmm. You know, m- remember Bismarck u- united Germany. And Germany was sort of, um, you know, its, ed- its universities were really quite amazing in a way. Um, I'm not a big fan of German philosophy, you know, but but you can see the the profound intelligence of um, these thinkers. So, um, but but German historiography was top notch. You know, their their historic, essentially historical critical work, their their ability to um, critically engage um, texts and cultures, and to do so essentially from you know, a non a non Christian perspective, but I mean, it was it was uh, the research that they did. Um, you know, was quite groundbreaking. So anyway, that's Dollinger's context. And so, what Dollinger says is, he says, look, um, he he's also going to make an accusation of doctrinal corruption. 
and and as you as you said, he is excommunicated after the mm -hmm. after the first Vatican Council. Mm -hmm. Dollinger says the key thing that Dollinger says is that is that it's historians, it's scholars, who know what tradition contains. So he says like bishops don't know. Bishops have been caught up in all this. Um, you know, they're not educated. You know, bishops are not very educated, and the Pope certainly is not educated. And he says that historians, scholars know, scholars know um, what tradition contains and, and what scripture contains as well. But but he was interested, he was focused on tradition. And what Dollinger says is, look, you know, we know, we as historians know that papal infallibility was not present, not present at all in the patristic church. And Dollinger has these incredibly um, strong arguments. He gives these arguments, you know, uh, showing that there was no papal infallibility um, in, and, and let alone um, anything like jurisdiction or anything like that. Um, there was no papal infallibility, no claim to papal infallibility um, in the early church. But the main, the key is this, guy. the key is this. The, what I really want to emphasize, Dollinger says, we don't really need the Pope to tell us what's in tradition. It's mm. scholars, it's historians that know mm. what's in tradition. Mm. So, so you don't really need the living magisterium. You, you see, that's kind of the key. You you see that that you get that stuff today. Mm. You know where people kind of say we know what's in tradition. You know, and we don't need the living magisterium to tell us. Yeah, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And so Dollinger, um, you get that from the left and from the right. You know, um, and so. Dollinger is a key figure, and Newman responds to him very, very importantly because, um, well, Dollinger, there's a complicated story, but Dollinger was working with Lord Acton, and which was his, who was his student, and working with Gladstone. So when Newman responds to Gladstone in his famous letter to the Duke of Norfolk, where he is yeah. defending people infallibility, yeah, Newman is actually responding to Dollinger. Mm -hmm. He doesn't name Dollinger. But he is giving his response about what are the limits of history are and what history can accomplish. And, and it's a very powerful statement of, um, of the relationship of the scholar and of, of the historian and of the theologian, you know, mm -hmm. to the, the magisterium of the church, to mm -hmm. a church that is not built upon scholars, but is built upon the successors of the apostles. But Newman, of course, has a place for scholars. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very um, important uh, statement. Um, the letter to the Duke of Norfolk, read in the context of Dollinger, mm -hmm. is a very, very rich uh, thing. But Dollinger, of course, just he was he was a German nationalist, and he he thought these Italians were just so backward. <laughs> mm -hmm. so he was as all these backward Italians. We got to bring them up to the modern world, and so on. You know, so Dollinger himself. Although not a man, I mean, Dollinger, Dollinger is certainly um, representative of, of uh, German theology today, you know, in that way. But Dollinger is also representative of traditionalist, you know, with a capital T mm -hmm. uh, theology insofar as Dollinger held that, you know, w you know, we can know, like a scholar, you get traditionalists who, who, um, you know, write books where it turns out that they know what tradition contains and they don't really need the Pope to tell them. If the Pope steps out of line, they'll just tell the Pope that he's committing heresy because mm -hmm. they know, they know. That's called private judgment. And Newman, Newman names it as private judgment and he rejects it. Mm -hmm. But he still has a place for historical research. And, and it's based on, Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh no! I was just saying it. it's good. I, I love Newman is it's a great it's a great uh, work. Now, so when Newman addresses the extent of the theologian in weighing in on these discussions, how does it really does it line up with what we see later on with Don and Veritatis? Is it effectively that position, or is it different? Well, you know, I think it's, I would, I would say continuity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would say continuity with Dona Veritatis, but, but um, I, you know, it's a different world. It, 
I don't know. I mean, Newman himself doesn't doesn't talk about. Remember, Dunham, Dunham Veritatis gives a place um, for academic dissent, and I yeah. and I think yeah. I think um, yeah. I think that's correct. Although dissent understood in a certain way. Yeah. You know, for yeah. Dunham Veritatis, um, if there if there really is a difficulty, you know, if there if there mm -hmm. really is a difficulty, and the magisterium is going down a a, diff a path that really isn't right. Mm -hmm. To me, an example of that would be like the um, the magisterium weighed in at various points over the over the two thousand years of the church weighed in on the Jewish people. Yeah, and yeah. The, there were things that Pope said and, and the council said about the Jewish people that just are not acceptable. Mm -hmm. They're they're not true either. Mm -hmm. And so, but they never they never were said definitively. <laughs> you know, sure. there was no. It wasn't like a teaching, a church teaching, or whatever. But so it was certainly practice. But and so. You know, if theologians weigh in and, and reflect and ponder and so on, so Dona Veritatis has a place for that. But remember, um, for Newman though, he's in a different context, and yeah, and yeah. Newman doesn't think in terms of um, in terms of like um, as we're publicly dissenting from Pius the Ninth. Yeah. Now, yeah. now Newman does though. Um, what instead of publicly dissenting, Newman uh, calls it like interpretation. So okay. uh, you know, so like when Newman is confronted with a syllabus of errors. And the syllabus of errors, you remember, is um, a famous document from 1864 from, um, I think it's 1864, from Pope Pius IX, mm -hmm. where uh, the um, Pope Pius is collecting um, mm -hmm. like sententia um, from earlier encyclicals and, and um, mm -hmm. you know, papal writings, you know, and so he's, these are, the, the syllabus errors is a syllabus, it's a collection. It's not a new, not something new, but it's a collection. Mm -hmm. But so Newman then, Newman interprets it. And so Newman is on the side saying that, look, um, the syllabus itself is is not infallible. Mm -hmm. You know, there can be um, error and it does not require the assent of faith. It requires simply the docility, yeah. you know, of the believer, the believer to um, receive it, to be docile to it. Mm -hmm. But the believer doesn't have to have to hold that there's that there's nothing that that may, might not change. Mm -hmm. you know, um, and so Newman then is just giving an account of papal infallibility that is mm -hmm. is is, is um, not maximalist. You know, in mm -hmm. other words, there there are things in in the magisterial teaching that may be um, may be changed, may be, um, mm -hmm. may not be um, true, or maybe only partly true. Mm -hmm. You know, but Newman is docile though, it, and you know, he receives it in a docile fashion. He doesn't. Um, you know, he doesn't sort of go into um, dissent mode where he starts to publicly uh, challenge right. Pius IX, you know, as some sort of um, uh, heretic or, or some sort of false teacher. You know, he he receives, but he he receives, but he interprets. <laughs> that kind of thing. Sure, sure. Now, does does that also indicate that Newman recognized a distinction between definitive and non-definitive teachings of the magisterium? Oh yeah, de definitely. He, he definitely did, and mm -hmm. and um, so Newman has a, a strong place for the possible just the fact that everything that is is said by the magisterium is not an infallible. It's it's not said in an infallible mode. Sure. And so what that, what that means is that is that although Newman knew that God God the Holy Spirit guides the church, um, there there is a place there's you know a place for error or for things that are not well said or or things that need to be said better or some things that are just simply error mm -hmm. you know that can be present in magisterial uh teaching and, and newman would absolutely uh, think that to be the case yeah very helpful now in the conclusion you note that newman believe it's not always possible to tie up loose ends in some matters that relate to theology and history you know i know a lot of catholics today some specifically who they are almost obsessed with answering every single possible conceivable objection to Catholicism, as if you have to have an answer to absolutely everything. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about Newman on that? Because I think what some people are going to say, well, if that's Newman's position, that he doesn't think that you can always tie up loose ends, does that not mean that really some of the Catholic claims are unfalsifiable? Well, so you know, remember Newman, Newman would think in terms of like cumulative cumulative probabilities. That's how mm -hmm. that's how he um, understands like a demonstration to work in the in areas of 
uh, in the area of history. Okay. You know, for, for him, you know, you can't have any, you can't have mathematical um, certitude, but you you can't have certitude that's based on cumulative probabilities. Okay. Um, in yeah. in history, in matters that pertain to history, um, and he thinks that that can include um, you know, matters that pertain to faith. But but um, now the issue is kind of like you know how are you gonna how are you going to tie up all loose ends when you're when you're dealing with something like um, like the dogma of papal infallibility or right. the dogma of the right. conception? Now, what you might say, well, what what is a loose end? <laughs> well, yeah. a loose end would be like something like every, people when they're fighting against papal infallibility, they they bring up uh, Honorius, mm -hmm. you know, who mm -hmm. was a pope um, early on, or or they might. They might do like Dollinger does, and Dollinger brings up the fact that um, a good bit, a good portion of of, of some of the decretals on which the popes the popes um, define their power, they begin to understand their power in the medieval period. A good a good portion of these decretals um, were invented by scribes. You know, were or, you know, now they could have been based on other decretals that that were uh, not invented, you know, mm -hmm. but some of them were just simply invented. Some of the, some scribes just simply wrote the decretals that they needed to have in order to justify, you know, some claim. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's so how are you gonna tie up all these things and sort of know with certitude that that um, that on historical grounds, you're, you have a unshakable case. Mm -hmm. um, Newman thinks that there is a place for faith here you know that in other words that we're dealing with cumulative probabilities and so when you're making historical arguments you make a good argument but but you're not necessarily going to be able to um make a make an argument that's equally powerful under on all fronts there, yeah. there may be yeah. maybe an occasional area where um where you just say well you know we'll we'll wait for a future historian to unravel mm -hmm. that one fully you know so but you're still going to have a very strong cumulative case, um, in Newman's view. You you might you might have like a string or two, you know, that is going to need to be uh, dealt with. You know, some of these things like, you know, another an example of this that people bring up would be um, some of the changes in terms of Petrian privilege mm -hmm. that that develop in the in the um, understanding of marital indis indissolubility. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like where does where does Petrian privilege come from, <laughs> or this kind of thing? And there were, you know, this stuff. So, you know, how are you going to figure it all out historically and then prove it and this and that? And and Newman thinks that look, you have a cumulative case, but but in faith, you know, faith. It's these things are matters of faith. Mm -hmm. you know, so, faith is not opposed to reason, but reason, even though reason can give support to faith, reason can't as it were, give the gift of faith, <laughs> you know, reason can be in support of faith, but Newman doesn't see reason here functioning as like mathematical reason, you know, where mm -hmm. you're, you're, um, you're making a demonstration that is um, like airtight, sure. you know, um, and airtight in the mathematical sense. Um, and, and to some degree, in my view, and in my view, to some degree, you can find in the neo-scholastic, the great neo-scholastic, who I greatly admire, but you can find a little bit of this overdoing it for I, for example when i read gergou lagrange and he's he insists that there must have been a um you know an esoteric um knowledge that was handed down of mary's bodily assumption mm -hmm. gergou lagrange mm -hmm. insists that there must have been um it must have been handed down from bishop to bishop until it was finally publicly taught you know in a full way Mm. Um, in in the fifth and sixth century, and he he says it must have just been handed down. Um, and if it hadn't been handed down, then then it, it wouldn't be historically justifiable. Mm. And I think I think that's not not the case. New, Newman Newman himself moves away from that type of thing. Um, you know that was a the, the tractarians um, used that that idea of this esoteric knowledge. You know that handed down from bishop to bishop. The tractarians used yeah. that in order right. to like fill up any any historical gaps. Sure. You know, like where did this come from? But and Newman does that. His, his first book, his first book, Arians, the Arians of the fourth century. But but Newman goes away from that. And he by the time he's writing essay and development of Christian doctrine, he he does not he does not hold this discipline a um, discipline 
um, Arcani. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> You know, so that anyway, that's kind of I don't know if I answered the question. Very, <laughs> very, very much. Yeah, I, I didn't know that Lagrange held, held to that view. It reminds me of uh, the Protestant James White, who often depicts Catholics as maintaining that view that there's this esoteric knowledge passed from one bishop to another. And that's what we refer to as oral tradition. I always smile when I hear that. <laughs> but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, yeah. let me so uh-huh. let me ask. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's right. It, it, it's, um, you know, on, on historical matters, Gary Lagrange is often often weak. I mm-hmm. think on historical matters, he's he, he's not as as educated as Newman was by any means on on historical matters. But mm-hmm. but on philosophical matters, uh, Gary Lagrange, and on many other matters, you know, Gary Lagrange is a great master, a great thinker, mm-hmm. a great Catholic. Um, but that doesn't mean he's right all the time. <laughs> of course, absolutely. Now, do you think that, in conclusion, that Newman, at the end of the day, end of the day, succeeded um, in warding off the threat of doctrinal corruption? Well, and so Newman's point is this: that the that the church, it's the church, it's the Holy Spirit that wards off doctrinal corruption. Mm-hmm. And but Newman's Newman's thing though was just that. If you care about doctrinal development, mm-hmm. you're going to care about doctrinal corruption. That's the thing. And so, um, to me, that's the crucial thing because Newman, um, you know, you obviously you, you're not if if you don't believe there's been a deposit of faith, if you don't cr- believe that Christ revealed anything, if you don't believe if you believe that the church really does invent everything um, to correspond with each era. You know, then then you're not going to worry about doctrinal corruption, but you won't have doctrinal development either. All you'll have is just invention, reinvention, and making things up. And so um, Newman, um, at the end of his life, was quite confident that the Catholic Church had sustained, you know, the faith of the apostles, had developed it truly, and had sustained it. But but Newman, at the same time, also was very sensitive and aware of the fact that the Catholic Church was not perfect, you know, that there were troubles, there were things that were going to need to be, you know, there were things for the next generations, you know, sure. you know and so I think we're in the same position today. Mm-hmm. Now, I do see a, um, a question here in the chat I'm going to grab in just a moment, but y'all go ahead and put some more questions in the chat. Make sure to put them to at Reason and Theology. If nothing else, what would you say is the overall takeaway that you want us to again take away from the book, if nothing else. Well, the, the truth of the the truth of the takeaway that I'm looking for has to do with our current situation. It, it honestly does, because mm-hmm. um, because there are theologians, I would call them Ronarian, and I describe them in the introduction to the book. Mm-hmm. There are contemporary theologians who are ignoring, um, they're talking about development, but they're ignoring corruption. Yeah. And, and I, and they're, they're minimizing or else they're, they're, they're denying the existence of a deposit of faith, a, mm-hmm. a cognitively noble deposit of faith. They're essentially, they're religiously liberal Catholics. Yeah. So I think that, I think that we are um, in a situation where, you know, we're going to go through a generation um, it, I mean, it could take a few decades um, mm-hmm. where um, religiously the rural Catholics will be in a dominant position. Now, now the reason for this is because, um, you know, as you know, after the Second Vatican Council, um, the the neo in the in the race of Mont sort of fought each other to death, and right. so there, were, you know, there was nobody left. <laughs> You know, and so what there was was sort of a religious liberalism that came out of the 1960s, and that was what implemented the council because the the, um, even immediately after the council, people like De Lavac and and stuff who were were certainly not religiously liberal, but they they were they were seen as sort of the old guard who were outdated, and they were ignored. Um, so if, anyway, so but certainly the neo classics also were were done. Mm-hmm. So after the council, you have these religious religiously liberal um, Catholic thinkers, um, in religiously liberal in different ways. But they sort of take over, and they're the ones that train the the gen- they train twenty five years of, of of Catholic priests. Mm-hmm. So the, you know, that's a that's an important thing to think about. 
So I think it could take a few decades where the church, um, you know, does um, where these religiously liberal um, Catholics trained in, in religious liberal theology um, mm -hmm. have their day, you know, they have their time. And, and so my thought is that during this time, whatever long it is, um, you know, that Catholics can raise concerns about, about doctrinal corruption, raise concerns about religious liberalism, um, but while, while doing it in, in a Newmanian way, you know, that's, that's key, you know, a Newmanian way that is, you know, very, very careful and, and balanced. And that would be my goal. That's my hope. <laughs> yeah. So, so on the one hand, we have that problem with religious liberalism today that sounds more like a doctrinal evolution and corruption view than anything. And then on the other hand, what we have is uh, some who want to say um, that you can completely discard the living magisterium because the living magisterium can be subject to doctrinal error to the extent of teaching heresy. And this isn't coming from a liberal perspective. This is coming from more the extreme right. So earlier we spoke about uh, doctrinal reversals, and we, we all agree that there can be doctrinal reversals because the church can teach non-definitively. There could be a level mm -hmm. of error in the magisterium of the church. But then the question is, how high can that error be? Can it ever be of the note of heresy? Could, it, could you ever have the universal magisterium, that is the Pope acting as the universal teacher or an ecumenical council, could you ever have them teach heresy though non-definitively not not teaching it definitively we we all agree that's excluded but some are going to say but you could have a universal organ of the magisterium teaching heresy perhaps a pope non-definitively teaching heresy in a papal encyclical or vatican II non-definitively teaching heresy in nostra etate or something like that what where do you weigh in on this question yeah. Well, uh, Nostra Aetate is Nostra Aetate is very important. Nostra Aetate is true, and Nostra Aetate is um, the Church's response to the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so no, if you're going to get rid of Nostra Aetate, um, that just shows um, profound, profound historical ignorance. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, and and really tragic. It's a really tragic thing. But but uh, anyway, so that's just sort of my two cents on that. But the 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 real the issue that you're talking about though is a broader one. Now, here, I think this we got to make a few distinctions, and we, you know, one thing that we got to say is that, um, you know, uh, what is heresy? Mm -hmm. Well, so heresy would be um, if, if like you have a pope who teaches, and here I'm going to define what I think heresy involves. It would mean teaching in a in a weighty magisterial document, not just offhand remark, sure. but teaching in some weighty magisterial document, not infallibly, but but nonetheless, teaching against a dogma, well, let me be more specific, teaching directly and explicitly against a dogma of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So a heresy then would be if you have a dogma that has been taught by the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. and let's just use, um, let's just use that, uh, you know, Nicaea, you know, as one. Mm -hmm. Like if you have a if you have a pope in an encyclical say that Jesus was that Arius was correct. Mm -hmm. Explicitly and directly say Arius was correct. And unfortunately the church got that wrong. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so that'd be an example. And so there that's what that's what I would say would be papal heresy. Now mm -hmm. now you could um, different from papal heresy is the idea that um, a pope could teach something that isn't true. Mm -hmm. you no, know, and I and I think yeah that that popes can popes and councils can teach things that aren't true, mm -hmm. um, as long as they're not teaching infallibly because not everything that they say is infallible. You know, yeah. so I don't I don't have a maximalist understanding of infallibility, yeah. but I do I do deny that certainly after Vatican One if you if you read the um, the text there of the you know the whole text of, of defining um, defining but also contextualizing you know the um, infallibility of the Pope. I certainly think that papal papal heresy defined understood the way I just defined it mm -hmm. uh, is not possible is is not possible in, unless unless maybe you could have some papal heresy 
followed immediately by the end of the world, by Jesus coming in. But, but there's all sorts of reasons why paper heresy is not possible um, theologically. And, and they're, you know, they're rooted simply in the, in the fact that, um, you know, what, I mean, well, I'm, I'm just going to have people go back and read the, read the text from Vatican I, and, and mm-hmm. I think it becomes clear. But so, but papal error, though, is a different thing. There, mm-hmm. there can be papal mm-hmm. error. Sure. And we do need to remember this whole issue, like, of direct and explicit teaching. So, so you could have a pope that undermines a dogma. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you certainly could. You, you could have an encyclical that undermines Nicaea. It undermines it in some way. You yeah. know, yeah. I don't, you know, it, not directly and explicitly um, rejecting it, but somehow undermining, you know. And, well, then what you would need is theologians to kind of say, look, you know, um, this this needs to be evaluated here. This, yeah. this teaching yeah. that the Pope has taught something, that it needs to be respected, and the Pope needs to be spoken about respectfully. Mm-hmm. But but theologians do need to evaluate it and to measure it against the dogma, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. the dogma. But um, but I do think, no, a, a Pope cannot explicitly and directly um, reject a, a dogma of the Catholic Church. I think that's impossible. And I think if you hold that, if you believe that that can be done, then, then you're really in a you you've made the you've made the dogma of papal infallibility into nonsense because because what happens then is that the pope is infallible whenever he happens to be infallible and then he's a heretic whenever he happens to be heretical, but look that's that's completely uh, you know ridiculous because you know you, you honestly you could have a pope infallibly declare something on on Monday, mm-hmm. on Monday you say I solemnly ex cathedra declare, you know that Mary is bodily assumed in heaven. And then on Tuesday, that Pope could say, in an encyclical, he could say, Mary was not was not bodily assumed into heaven. Right. And and it's right. just like, what's the purpose of, of the dogma of papal infallibility? He's he's the Pope is obviously, you know, it's ridiculous. So if you, if you believe that the Popes can can explicitly and directly teach heresy, then what you've done is you've made um, a laughing stock out of the dogma of papal infallibility, and you've done it as a theologian. I mean, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. But then you you also look um, Catholics also need to be take care of how they speak about the Pope. And Newman did mm-hmm. that. You know, Newman mm-hmm. was an opponent of Pope Pius the Newman Newman fought it. Uh, Newman fought a lot of what Pope Pius IX did. He fought yeah. it, but he he fought it in a proper way. Yeah, you know, yeah. he he spoke respectfully. He was docile, and he um, he understood he was just a theologian. He he didn't he didn't engage in private judgment. He he um, he understood he was just a theologian, but he he had a place, and so he he interpreted. You know, he he did his best. He was not a dissenter. He Newman was quite careful. So like when he is responding to the syllabus errors, which contains things in it that Newman did not accept, um, you know, he he accepted he accepted all in the syllabus errors that had been you know was dogmatic. But he does said, look, a lot of this is not dogmatic, mm-hmm. you know, and so there is room for 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 a question here. And Newman was quite right, quite right about that. Um, but he was very respectful in, in how he did that. He was not a dis- what he was not a dissenter. Yeah, you know. And anyway, so I think Newman's a great model. I do, I do think he's a great model. He's a model of patience, also, because look, he for thirty years. Although, although the first time he met the Pope Pius IX, who was a very friendly guy, yeah. uh, Newman and um, the Pope came over to Newman's quarters apparently in Newman yeah. when Newman was there in Rome in 1846-47, uh, and the Pope came over. Uh, at least that's, that's what I gather, and um, they got along great, you know. But but later on, Newman had to endure at, um, like 30 years yeah. of of a 25, 30 years of a papacy that Newman really felt uncomfortable with. Mm-hmm. And Newman did that in a very noble fashion, you know, very strong in the faith, promoting the faith, uh, loving the church, you know, but not, um, but, but of course in his letters, he would be open to people who needed to know, you know, he would yeah. give him his, tell them his opinions and he would alert them to what he thought, you know, and, and he would criticize, privately you know but he was he was a model i, I think of of our of, of a theologian's uh, vocation and a, and a catholic vocation 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly a model for us today, and I'm re I'm really uh, happy to hear that you've you've taken that position on uh, papal heresy. It kind of feels like it's a minority position these days. It seems like there's there's just so many people out there that think you know the Pope is teaching heresy. Oh, but it's okay because it's non-defendant. Well, they won't say it's okay, but they'll say it doesn't touch on the Catholic claims. It doesn't somehow disprove Catholicism because he didn't do it ex cathedra. So it, that view tends to be pretty popular. So I'm, I'm very pleased to hear you. Uh, yeah, but and, and you, usually what they mean, usually what they mean is they, um, I mean, it's a complicated situation, but they, mm -hmm. they mean one of two things. Some, sometimes they just mean the Pope's teaching error. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but that, of course, is, everybody's always known that's possible. That's not mm -hmm. heresy. <laughs> right, right. You know, because you got to teach against a dogma, something that's been dogmatically taught or, you know, you know, popes can teach things that are reversible, um, or else sure. everything they say would be um, sure. everything infallible. Be. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> which is which is absurd. But then, so maybe that's what they mean. But but then another case, though, that comes up uh, oftentimes has to do with the ordinary universal magisterium, mm -hmm. and so people will make judgments um, about things that have not been formally defined, but yet may have been. Um, defined insofar as you as the pope and all the bishops scattered around the world have taught the same thing and meant yeah. meant to teach it as as um commanding the ascent of faith right and so some of people will people will understand that for example like the death penalty right or um, something like that and so and so they will now my view on that is on cases like this is that if the pope ever were my view on this is if the pope ever were to teach directly and explicitly about um, some kind of case, let's take the death on an example, um, where one, as me as a private theologian, considered that the church had definitively, you know, infallibly through the ordinary universal magisterium taught that. If the Pope ever were to teach explicitly and directly against it, what I would learn from that as a theologian and, and a theologian committed not to engaging in private judgment mm -hmm. would be that I had been wrong about one thing. I'd been wrong to think that the ordinary universal magisterium, which is infallible, um, had taught that. I'd been wrong in my interpretation of, of the uni ordinary universal magisterium as it applied to that particular issue. I see. You know, because yeah. you remember that that it's theologians who decide that um, the ordinary universal magisterium has taught infallibly on such and such. But but it, it's, I think it's theoretically possible that um, that a theologian has got that wrong, and yeah. that in fact it hasn't been infallibly taught. Now, I would want to say though that in such a case, it could still be true. In other words, if the Pope reverses a position that's been held for however many uh, centuries mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by the death penalty or whatever, if the Pope reverses that, that doesn't mean the Pope's right. Right. Uh, but it does mean that we need some docility and some we need to reflect upon it. Sure. You know, but it, it doesn't mean the Pope has committed heresy because what it means then is that is that I haven't correctly judged the universal ordinary magisterium. Um, the Pope has, has made that judgment. You know, the living magisterium has made the judgment, you know, in that case. Now, now I'm not I'm not suggesting that such reversals, you know, of of consistent um, teaching over centuries. I'm not suggesting that I actually think that any of those that have occurred. I, I don't think there right. has been such a reversal right. Right. Um, that has occurred um, to, to um, as of today. Right. But I do think, um, I was just saying in the hypothetical, um, I would say that it'd be much more appropriate to conclude that the theologian had misjudged yes. than to conclude that the living magisterium had misjudged. Yes. Um, now, the issue of truth, though, if a pope would reverse something like that, it'd be, it'd be quite possible that the pope w was wrong on that, mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, because obviously there's good reason why, you know, why these things have been held for 2000 years. So anyway, this is my, these are my ideas, but I'm, I'm working out these ideas and these are, they have to do with hypotheticals. I don't, I don't believe sure. that anything like that has. So I, I, I accept Dignitatis Humanae. In fact, this guy named Michael Dunnigan. Yep. I've had him on the show. Oh, okay, okay, but okay, he's amazing, mm -hmm. and he's got this great book, and and um, but there's there's others as well. So <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad sure. to hear you. you know, show. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, yeah. 
it, it's uncanny how similar our views are. It's like to, to the T, uh, the, everything that you're saying, I, I wholeheartedly agree with. And and I even concede that you could have a case of a reversal of a reversal. I don't think you've ever, there has ever been right. such a thing, but I do think you bring up that point that even if something was uh, true and the Pope then reversed it at a lower level, right? Um, you could still have a reversal of the reversal. Um, I, I, although I don't think any of this is ever going to happen. I'm just saying theoretically. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I do I do grant that's that's possible. Although it would be certainly an odd thing. But but here you bring up a point that so few people bring up, and, and I'm glad to hear you bring it up. Um, because what I've pointed out is that if you have the Pope teaching something with a very high level of authority, and then another per Pope comes and reverses it, but he does so in a teaching of a lower authority, it doesn't automatically make that second Pope right. You would actually give your assent to the one with the higher weight, and thus the one with the lower weight in itself could be reversed. So glad to hear, hear you bring that up. Again, it's a point that's often overlooked. <laughs> Right, and and I think I think that our faith, we have to realize that that look, um, you know, Jesus Christ our Lord and the Holy Spirit are pouring out truth upon us. Mm -hmm. You know, the truth of the Catholic faith is um tremendous, and the heart of that truth, of course, is Jesus Christ our Lord and and the Holy Trinity and, and the sacraments and so on. But mm -hmm. so, uh, we are very gifted with with truth, and it is, nonetheless, though, um, if if we come to our faith and and we think that. That our faith relies upon, like having a um, a list of of sort of a list of the truths that Christ has given us, a full list, you know, like a full list, and then making sure that the Pope will never, they're never going to be the list is never going to change in any way. <laughs> See, this is not this is not our Catholic faith. Our, mm -hmm. our Catholic faith is not like that. Um, you know, our Catholic faith really is a living a living faith where we, you know, faith involves trust. You know, faith involves trust and faith also there is, you know, our church is is um, divine and it's also human. And so, um, you know, there are going to be, you know, mistakes and and so on. But but nothing, nothing that touches the deposit of faith and corrupts the deposit of faith. Um, but there will be, um, you know, mistakes and so on. Mm -hmm. you know, otherwise, everything would be infallible. Sure. So sometimes, people, sometimes people are looking for a faith that doesn't involve faith. A faith that doesn't involve trust. Look, that that's not for this world. You know, we are still like Abraham in a certain way. Now, of course, we follow Jesus Christ, our Lord, who um, enlightens us far more. Um, but nonetheless, we are still pilgrims. You know, <laughs> we sure. are still pilgrims. And, and I, you know, like. You know, wrapping it up here, I, I want to be sensitive to your time. I, I'm going to ask just a couple chat questions, but I have one quick one for you, just following up on what we just discussed. Since Newman recognized the concept of non-definitive teachings and thus magisterial reversals, did he take the position that the Pope could, however, teach heresy non-definitively, or would he say, no, that's impossible? Well, you know, I don't know. In terms of... <laughs> I think that he did. I mean, I, I'd have to take a quicker look at what he was said about Honorius. Mm -hmm. but I, I do think that Newman's view of Honorius was that Honorius wrote a letter, you know, that wasn't wasn't some sort of formal teaching, mm -hmm. but that, that wasn't a little bit of a shady letter. <laughs> you, mm -hmm. know, you, know I mean? you know, so I think that I think that was Newman's view that, um, you know, Honorius's letter, which was not some sort of solemn thing. You know, but did did teach something that wasn't wasn't true. You know, I, I'm gonna need I, I need to take a quick look back at sure. that. But. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, um, now the, here's a question from Colin. Uh, do you have any comments on the debate between the Salamantisenses and strict Thomas on development of doctrine? Dr. Minard is translating uh, Schultz now on his debate with Maureen Sola. <laughs> well, I love that question because I love the fact that. That um, whoever asked the question um, knows these uh, debates, um, <laughs> you know, which are very important. And so, and these guys, like Martin Sol, of course, um, knows Newman quite well, you know, mm -hmm. obviously. And so, these are very important, important, and, and beautiful debates. Now, my own my own background. I mean, I tend i i trust i trust like 
Reinhard Hooter and Andrew Mazaros. These are my development and doctrine guys. Mm -hmm. So on all matters uh, pertaining, I, I think the debates among the among the different neoclassic schools or Thomas schools, however you want to call that, um, the debates are are rich. They're important. They they tend to um, pertain to you know things like uh, vir you know virtual you know like the mode the mode in which um, you know uh, uh, some later propositions contain an earlier proposition and, and so on. Um, these are important debates and and they're rich debates, um, but. But my own interest in working on development um, really hasn't been to go into those debates. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to raise the issue of um, just reminding Catholics about corruption and, yeah. and yeah. we got um, that our faith is not based on power. Our faith is based on on truth. And so that means that means that, um, you know, that we have to that the exercise of the magisterium and the, and the whole um, the theologians who assist the magisterium you know, need to remember that, that it, you know, we can't, we can't do things to make the church look arbitrary, to make the church look sort of power based, as if everything was sort of, you know, who's, who's got the power, you know, now, mm -hmm. now there's going to be power struggles and, and so on. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not Pollyannish, but, but that's, that's, you can see that's the context for, for my um, intervention um, in these themes. I, I really am writing on, on doctrinal corruption and, and I'm not um, in this book, um, you know, pretending to be um, to weigh in in an expert fashion on on the whole on debates about about um, doctrinal development. Now, okay. I, when I do weigh in on those debates, though, I I do uh, follow um, Andrew Mazaros and Reinhard Hooter, and and Mazaros has this, has a great essay in Nova et Vetera on on this on Marin Sola and and so on. And I I just think he's right. So that that would be um, that. You know, to me, I, I start there. I know I've not answered your question because the question's too too um, deep, and and um, I just don't feel like I can do it justice. But um, I would start there, though, for sure, with Mazaros. And he follows up and says, "Dr. Dunnigan is going to be publishing his book in June." He read the dissertation; and it's excellent. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> he, he's certainly the man. All right, so here's one uh, last Colin, one. Colin Gordon. Colin Gordon uh, is a is a super, I mean, you're a super educated person. So I, yeah, I gotta, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta meet you and learn from you. <laughs> Here's one from Captain Skippy. Uh, what are some things we could say to those that believe the Novus Ordo is just a result of doctrinal corruption? Is is the liturgy even in the category of doctrinal corruption? Well, so the liturgy would be in the category of like the monuments of tradition. Mm -hmm. And so there is, um, there is an importance um, that the liturgy not not be not be corrupted, but mm -hmm. but then you do have to ask like, well, what are the what are the elements of the liturgy that um, you know that um, pertain uh, to dogma? You know that that in other words, that what are the elements that are just the core elements that if you corrupted them, I, I can think of some I can think of some right off the top. You know, so for example, if they if all of a sudden they they use um, coca-cola and hot dogs that's funny i i use i use the coca-cola and doritos analogy that's that's funny. okay <laughs> yeah 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 so so i think i think that we would need to we would need to say like what what kind of i i think the liturgy can be harmed mm -hmm. i think the liturgy mm -hmm. can there can be serious uh defects mm -hmm. you know but but like what would make it what would what would constitute something that gets right right to the core and and um you know, separates us um, from, you know, from from the right, you know, as, you know, in its core, core elements. I, I think it can be harmed, though. So, my, again, my it's the same thing that I think about dogma, you know, that I do think that, for example, the dogma of marital indissolubility. Can the dogma of marital indissolubility be harmed? Absolutely. In my view, in my view, the Argentinian proposal that the Pope affirmed harms the dogma it harms it undermines I, you know I'm, I'm talking about um communion for divorce and remarried but um i think it did it, it does cause it does undermine but it doesn't it doesn't reject it it doesn't deny it it doesn't it doesn't corrupt it it does it does in some way cause um an undermining sure uh, that's that's my p position but um i don't think it um you know i don't think it 
corrupts or rejects or denies the dogma. And so I think the same, you can have same similar things with the case of the liturgy, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. now, now, the liturgy, though, of course, is a very sensitive thing because, like, how do, you know, where do we go from here and so on? And, and like, who, who decides? And so ultimately, I do feel like the, the liturgy um, in the Catholic Church, it's a monument, it belongs to the monument tradition. And yet the liturgy is, you know, within the realm of the living magisterium to direct, because otherwise who's going to direct it? Like, like uh, you and me. And you know, see, that's my, my problem is that I feel that we, we can't do it. You know, it does have to be the, um, the living magisterium, you know, has, has a role and, and we as Catholics have to, have to like live, live with that, you know, and, and, and we, we, of course we can continue to raise concerns and to raise issues and so on. But I, I feel that I feel that the liturgy has not been corrupted. I feel that, that there may have been some elements that have have caused effect. You know, in my mind, the, um, the like the shifting of the of the um, ad orientum, you know, has caused some defect. Mm -hmm. I think so. But, but by defect, I'm not I'm not talking here about corruption. Sure, <laughs> you know, sure. You sure. know, I just think I just think it needs to be. I just think look, it's it's more it's more appropriate. It's it's, it's um, you know, better in, in every way um, yeah. to have at orientum in the Eucharistic prayer. Yeah. But, um, you know, like whether whether Latin has to be used, to me, that's not um, not clear, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and, but, but none of these things might be touch upon, like the core, the, mm -hmm. the core, what I'm calling the core, that if you really were to change it, it really would corrupt it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so I have a strong account of like, of what actually is corruptive. You know, and not not everything corrupts. That that there are things that undermine, but don't corrupt. Yeah. You know, corrupt corrupt has a specific meaning here. You know, it means to um, reject and deny um, things that pertain to the deposit of faith. Mm -hmm. You know, that literally pertain to the deposit of faith. To reject and deny um, things that pertain to the deposit of faith. You know, not that support the deposit of faith. Not you know. But, sure. Yeah. Yeah, very, very helpful. And and I think that we have to concede if there are such things as papal error, error and thus magisterial reversals, in a sense that does weaken the deposit of faith. It doesn't corrupt it, as you're saying, but yeah. there, there is a weakening, certainly. So I'm in agreement. There's some things that popes can teach that can undermine, uh, perhaps unintentionally, I'm going to assume, um, and perhaps weaken the Catholic position, and those should be. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. No, nobody's perfect, you know. What I mean? <laughs> sure. Yeah, because like, yeah. it's a living church. It's a living church, sure. and so you're gonna have, you're gonna have problems in every era. Every every era is gonna have its problems, and and like when um, you know, so in some eras the the popes um kind of assimilated themselves more toward like um toward rulers and toward yeah. um toward royalty, and of course sure. they they sure. ran the papal states. You know, and and they didn't really do a good job of that, to be honest with you. They did not do a good job of running the papal states. Uh, you know, and they 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 went into military battle. The, po the popes went right. into battle, right. and and these things these things very much undermined. They sure. they very much undermined the, the Catholic faith. And and you you have to see like if you read a, read a, a biography of Machiavelli, and you know I just recently, you know, within the past few years, um, you know read a biography of Machiavelli, and I realized that hey, you know, the church in every time has some has some pretty deep uh, struggles and. And, and nobody's perfect and and the, and so on and so the popes of the time did undermine they undermined but they didn't corrupt yeah they undermined but they didn't corrupt but they did undermine very very significantly and it, and there was um hell to pay in a sense that um martin luther and other things um uh, all the the protestant reformation these things came about you know in in significant part because of the tremendous um defects you know what sure. i call the defects yeah, but yeah. but nonetheless, um, nonetheless, God, God praise. We we are really gifted as Catholics. We have this incredible light of light of truth that that God has given us, and I feel very grateful to be a Catholic. Thank you so much. Very helpful. It was truly an honor to have you on. Everybody get it. Newman on doctrinal corruption. I put a link to it there in the show notes. Um, Dr. Levering, uh, again, honor to have you on. Is there any plug that you want to put in in addition to the book? Anything else you want to make us aware of? I, I, tell you, I think I'm sort of a boring writer. I am a little bit boring, but I try my best to learn from other people, and I'm eager to learn from any of the audience. Just, just email me. I'm, I, I'd love to learn from people and to 
try to be a better theologian. Yeah, very and a better good. Catholic. Yeah, awesome. Well, I'll I'll put your contact in the description where people can reach out to you if they have any uh, feedback. But once again, thank you so much for coming on and doing this. Truly an honor. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> and everybody, thank y'all for watching. Hit the like button and the subscribe button. And that's going to do it. We will see y'all next time. God bless. If you're looking to buy or sell a home, office, or any kind of property anywhere in the world, you're going to want to call Real Estate for Life, and they're going to connect you with a Catholic agent. Now, that agent will donate a portion of their commission upon sale, and Real Estate for Life will donate 75% of that gift to a pro-life organization at no cost to you. Call Real Estate for Life at 1-877-LIFE-US1 or text them 248-431-1440. If you care about the pro-life cause, call them now.